the Joe Rogan experience. Now, let's talk about treatments that are being considered. Uh, we know that z packs are one of them, uh, and chloroquine. Can you explain mm-hmm. that and, and what went horribly wrong with the couple that took the wrong kind of chloroquine and uh, turned out to be uh, koi pond cleaner? Okay, so let me, let me put, give you the framework for that so it makes some sense. When okay. we talk about all the interventions... You have things that are going to be ready down the line, things are going to be ready a little closer, and things ready now. So, and then and then we can talk about one on one, and then I'll I'll, I'll we could, let me give you the framework, then I'll t- t- answer your chloroquine question. So, the highest bar there is in terms of financial investment required and time to show safety is a vaccine. So that's what that's what we're doing, and other groups are doing. Next tier down, that's going to be, you know, a year, 18 months away, according to Dr. Fauci, could be longer than that. Next tier down are what we call small molecule drugs, new drugs that have never been discovered before. It still takes a while, maybe not as high a bar as vaccine in terms of time. The next tier down is repurposing existing medicines that we already know are relatively safe and then showing that those drugs also work against the coronavirus, and that's going to be the chloroquine category, and I'll get to your question. And then the the nearest ones, the one that we could do now, is what's called this convalescent uh, antibody therapy, uh, which I've been pushing very hard on because I think we can actually have it going na- right now. So let's do the um, uh, let's do the the chloroquine hydroxychloroquine. This is uh, uh, and that's one of the repurposed ones. That's not the lowest hanging fruit, but the next lowest hanging fruit. This is a medicine that's used for malaria. It's an anti-malarial drug. It's been around for decades. In fact, the World Health Organization was going to had in the 1960s proposed an elimination strategy for malaria to treat everybody with chloroquine until we had chloroquine resistance and that derailed that. But in in, in some parts of the world, it still works as an anti-malarial drug. It's also used as an anti-inflammatory drug for the treatment of lupus and other autoimmune diseases. You can make a bucket of it. It's cheap. Uh, We know the safety profile. We know it can cause arrhythmias in some patient and other toxicities, but it generally has a pretty good safety profile. Um, we know that this drug can block the replication of the virus in the test tube, so it inhibits the virus in, the, in, in what we call in vitro in the test tube. Second, we know this drug uh, reduces inflammation, and that's nice because one of the things you get with COVID-19 pneumonia is you not only get the virus infection in the lung, you got a lot of inflammation. So it checks a couple of boxes in terms of why it's attractive to look at it. And then the Chinese did a small study and then a, a colleague of mine is a fascinating guy. Uh, I, I'm, I, I really appreciate his work as a scientist. He's a very serious scientist in Marseille, in France, named Didier Raoult. And he's, I don't know, must have published at least two or three dozen papers in the journal that I uh, uh, founded called PLOS Neglected Tropical Diseases. He's a serious scientist, works on all sorts of intracellular bacteria and that kind of thing, tick-borne diseases did a small study showing that it worked in COVID patients. And what he did was he combined hydroxychloroquine with this z the azithromycin drug, and found, found that there's an effect. The problem was it was a very tiny study. And so people put those three things together and all of a sudden said, we've got the miracle cure. Uh, I, I'm not sure that's going to turn out to be the case. I mean, we really need to do large studies to show that it really works. And the reason I'm holding back is, uh, you know, nothing to do with uh, Dr. Professor Raul, who's, you know, a really important scientist, but it's a small study. We were there about a decade ago with influenza, that this hydroxychloroquine also inhibited uh, the influenza virus in the test tube, but then it didn't pan out in in larger clinical studies. So I think we have to be really careful and don't be too quick to to say, okay, this is this is going to be it. I don't. We're we're not even close to that yet. But we'll know in the next few weeks because we're re- working hard to scale up uh, clinical trials looking at that medicine. Now, um, in, in in terms of vaccines, not, but, wait, but there is yeah. a there is a there is a new there's something new though that we can do right now. Okay, uh, that, that I'll talk to you about. So this is uh, something called convalescent antibody therapy, and it was. And it was no, it's been known for over a hundred years, 
and it was really uh, scaled up during the 1918 influenza pandemic. You know, that terrible pandemic that killed hundreds, tens of millions of people. It was shown that if you took individuals had, who had recovered from the disease, who had got infected, they survived, they had antibodies in their blood, you could remove their blood, in some cases give them back their red cells, and take the plasma component and use that as a therapy to treat patients. And, uh, and in fact, during the 2003 uh, SARS epidemic, the first SARS, SARS-1, there's been a number of studies showing that it worked. It actually, you could treat patients for it, uh, especially if you gave it early on in the course of the infection. If you waited too long, then it didn't have nearly the same benefit. But if you gave it early on in the course of infection, it could prevent more serious infection and even death because you're actually giving back antibodies. The antibodies won't last forever, but enough to help you survive the infection. So um, uh, a good friend and colleague who I've known for a long time, Arturo Casadevall, is a brilliant uh, professor of microbiology at Johns Hopkins, you know, started talking to me about, you know, Peter, maybe we should be doing this for uh, COVID-19. And and as the numbers started going up, I said, I called him, I said, look, Arturo, I'm going on CNN tomorrow. Uh, I, I think this is an opportunity to tell people about this. So I, you know, helped amplify uh, what he was doing, he had written a, a paper uh, with a with a colleague uh, from Johns Hopkins, uh, Lee Sam Perron, per, 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 I always get her, I always mangle her name, Perfoski uh, uh, at at Albert Einstein, and I talked to him about this, and that really got things moving along. So I've been trying to use my voice on, you know, being on CNN and Fox News, and it's not not just to hear myself talk, but to actually raise specific issues to get people to care about about certain things and i and i used it for this purpose and, it, and i think it helped to mobilize some action and now uh what our and his colleagues are doing together with the fda so there's a branch of the food and drug administration called CBER, the center for biologics evaluation research which is this amazing you know you hear a lot of bad things about the fda i i think the fda is amazing myself but CBER is something very special all these brilliant scientists who deal with vaccines and biologic they're on board with it i've been talking with peter marks dr peter marks who's the head of CBER. And he's teamed up with, with Arturo to get this network together going at least among 20 academic health centers so that they're identifying patients who've recovered, taking their blood, giving them back the red cells, collecting the plasma so that when people come in sick, uh, they can give treatment. And they'll have some clinical trial results, I hope, in the next few weeks. But I'm really optimistic about that one for, for saving lives. The other thing Arturo's talked to me about is you know, could you use it in smaller doses to give the antibody to healthcare workers and to first responders uh, to prevent them from getting sick? Because you're here. I mean, I don't know the percentage now of first responders uh, in New York, and that's why they turned the Empire State Building into a siren last night and and to to honor all of the all of the first responders who have gotten sick. We knew this was going to happen. Maybe this this could help them. So I think that's going to be really important as well. Now, the French government, I was reading an article this morning that they've sanctioned chloroquine as uh, an official treatment, and uh, that they're, they're having some good results with that. Are, are people currently using that in the United States? Are doctors prescribing that with CPAC? There's, there's, there's a lot of what's called off-label use, meaning that it's not an improved indication, but they're going ahead and use it. And, uh, you know, I just, I think, the, and, and maybe it'll turn out to be a, a good treatment, uh, but the evidence is is not strong uh the there's a study in shanghai that suggested it didn't work so we really need well controlled uh, trials we really need to pin down the dose because maybe it's a dosing thing maybe if you give too high or too low a dose it's not going to work how you pair it with the zithromax so it's going to take a little bit of time to work out and this is the frustration that people have you know you're saying my god we have this terrible pandemic now we need to get these new therapies and vaccines out very quickly, it's the hardest thing to do. It's the hardest thing to do is to accelerate new technologies for uh, a, a new virus pathogen that we've never seen before while the epidemic is raging, while the pandemic is raging. It's re we, we've, we don't have a lot of track record doing this. We did it w once uh, with Ebola. Uh, if you remember in 2014, 
there was a, a terrible Ebola epidemic in West Africa, affected 33,000 people, 11,000 people died. Uh, that was in Guinea, Liberia, and Sierra Leone. And there were some initial vaccine trials started by a uh, Merkin company uh, that looked pretty promising. They had licensed the technology from the Canadians, this group in Manitoba, uh, Public Health uh, Canada, and it looked promising. But as the trials got underway, what happened was there was an international response to put in a health system because it turns out Ebola is not very transmissible. You just have to have some healthcare infrastructure, make certain that you're not directly handling the, the corpse of someone who's recently uh, died from, from Ebola virus infection. And, the, and we even sent in the 101st Airborne. Uh, division. We sent in the, the Screaming Eagles, which made a big impact on helping to uh, say, you know, save West Africa from this infection. So the WHO came in. Uh, there was uh, UNICEF. There was uh, Doctors Without Borders. Lots. Of, I'm sorry, I'm, the Israeli Army came in. Israeli Defense Force came in. A lot of groups came in to help West Africa. And so the vaccine never really got fully tested. But then five years later, when there was the terrible epidemic in Democratic Republic of Congo, that's when the vaccine really came into widespread use. And it's probably one of the most important public health stories never told, uh, which was under conditions of terrible conflict and war and political strife and uh, uh, civil, civil war, uh, they vaccinated 200,000 people with this vaccine. And it largely helped uh, eliminate Ebola from Democratic Republic of Congo in that in that during those hostilities last last year and uh, essentially saved uh, I think it's helped to stabilize the whole African continent um, so it's an amazing uh, story and again it was this multilateral effort that involved also the U.S. government the NIH and BARDA and and all of these organizations it's an extraordinary story and as a result. Uh, we really helped stabilize uh, uh, sub-Saharan Africa. But we'll look at the time frame, 2014, first epidemic to 2019, that's five, that's five years. That's a more realistic time frame uh, for a vaccine, just to give people a sense of perspective. 